ingenuity. Innovation. Dedication. Riley Industries. Looking back to the future. Riley Industries is a supplier of component ingredients to a remarkable list of products. From vitamins to breakfast foods. From pharmaceuticals to shampoos. From pesticides to protective coatings for underground pipes. But the story of Riley Industries is more than its 150 different products. More than its hundreds of different patents. Riley Industries is people. Since its inception, Riley Industries has employed hundreds of chemists, supervisors, engineers, operators, accountants, maintenance personnel, and support staff. Names like Edwards, Sislak, and of course, P.C. Riley. In 1893, while working for Childs and Company, P.C. was sent from Brooklyn, New York, to manage a small tar distilling plant in Indianapolis, Indiana. When Dad came out, he was put in charge of the plant, and they were selling, making a creosote here and selling it down in Mississippi in competition with the imports from Europe. And when you deducted the freight, why the return here was so low that the plant was running at a, at a loss. So Dad said to Childs, well, why don't we get in the wood, wood treating business here? And Childs thought that was a good idea, but he didn't do anything about it. To do nothing was something that the 24-year-old PC could never be accused of. He could see that the railroads were expanding, creating a growing need for treated wood for ties. He could see a growing market in treated telegraph poles and marine piling. P.C. Riley could see opportunity. So, while still working for Childs and & Company, and with a $1,500 loan from Mr. Childs, P.C. built his first wood treating plant. In the late 1800s, business in America experienced rapid growth and change, and the tar refining industry was no exception. In 1896, four of the industry's leaders including Childs and Company, merged to form the Barrett Company. It was then that PC was asked to report to the St. Louis plant. Realizing the impact this move would have on his wood treating facility, PC took action. He purchased the Indianapolis plant and, along with a partner, began operating what would be known as the Western Chemical Company. In a constant effort to find new markets for his creosoting business, P.C. discovered that cities in Europe, such as Paris, were paving their streets with wooden blocks that were quieter and more efficient for the horse traffic of the day. And although P.C. was not the first to discover this innovation, he was one of the first to take action. You see, most people saw these streets as being paved with treated wooden blocks. P.C. saw them as being paved with gold. By 1905, P.C. Riley was the sole owner of the Republic Creosoting Company, Incorporated, which supplied treated wood blocks that paved the streets of New York, Chicago, and Indianapolis, to name a few. A company which, like its owner, would continue to be a leader by innovation. As Republic grew, P.C. continued to be involved in every aspect of the operation, and although his formal education extended only through high school, his drive and thirst for knowledge helped to shape the refining industry. He was a hands-on operator, and so he was out in the lab quite a lot and did plan distillations and so forth. He noticed that when he heated, put the tar in a flask to distill it, using a bunch of burner to heat it, by the, some of the distillate uh, would, would condense on the top of the flask and drop back into the, into the tar it was in the, and so he thought, well, the, 
that's uh, kind of redundant to put it in there and, and try to have to distill it out all over again. So he uh, figured out if you insulated the top of that flask, why well, uh, the top would be odd enough so the material wouldn't condense. And then he found, after he did that, then he found that uh, he was getting more oil from the tar than he had been before. And so um, he, he carried that on and, and developed a still which was insulated top and bottom. The Riley still did produce a greater quantity of much heavier oil. And although the distillation process of today has changed radically, many of the concepts remain the same. P.C. Riley was once quoted as saying, our country has reached its geographic frontiers and to continue its growth and progress, we will have to seek new frontiers in the field of research. As early as 1920, he established a research laboratory that would soon boast a staff of seven chemists under the direction of Dr. I.H. Derby. It was there, in a two-room lab, that P.C. began to realize the fruits of research. When I came, <clears throat> um, we each one were assigned certain uh, things we might do. One was on naphthalene, and one was on uh, flotation oil, and, and uh, one was on uh, carbazole, and so on. Well, I was sort of, uh, at a, at a, I wasn't assigned to anything particular. So I started uh, with the pitch coke, Mr. Riley's pitch coke, which, which was produced. He was the only one, you know, producing uh, pitch coke in the, in the, in the country. <clears throat> and uh, I found that I could produce a carburizing compound from that uh, coke, basic, basically from that pitch coke. With chemicals, I could make a uh, carburizing compound for case hardening automobile parts, such as uh, camshafts and uh, piston pins and gears. And uh, we, I patented that product. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was uh, uh, sold to all the uh, automotive companies and uh, others who were case hardening. The company continued to grow both through the development of new products and the construction of new refineries and treatment plants. But it was on May 15th, 1932, that P.C. Riley may have made the most surprising move of all. During the depths of the Depression, he purchased the bankrupt International Combustion Tar and Chemical Corporation, a purchase that included six tar refineries a purchase that would change the tar refining industry. Those plants added a couple of new products, naphthalene. We hadn't gotten into naphthalene yet at that time. So we, we got into naphthalene in a big way. And then the phenolic resins that were making at Newark plant, the Newark plant, uh, making phenolic, those two products. And then also road tar. And we started with road tar I mean, at that time. But then almost immediately over the next few years, we got into pipe enamels for, for uh, pipe, uh, oil and pipe lines, and that became a big product. Throughout the Depression, the Riley companies continued to thrive. In fact, Republic Creosoting and its affiliate company, Riley Tar and Chemical, were successful in retaining their entire workforce during a period when most businesses were struggling and jobs were scarce. The creosoting division continued to produce railroad ties and utility poles along with wood blocks that were now most commonly used as flooring in factories. The tar refining division continued to produce creosote oil along with a variety of roofing pitches and other tar-based products. But even then, PC realized that these markets would have a limited life and so more and more emphasis was placed on chemical research. And it was this dedication, along with the talents of Dr. Frank Sislak, that would open a new world for P.C. Riley. At the end of the 30s, I think it was, uh, uh, the DuPont uh, came out with this Zeeland uh, water repellent product, 
and they needed uh, more pyridine than uh, we could supply. See, pyridine was a, ver was a, a product that uh, was a byproduct from uh, light oils uh, from the uh, steel industry and from coal tar <coughs> and light oils. It came in about 40, I'd say about 40, uh, this uh, demand. And uh, so uh, that's when Dr. Sislak started the research. He, he saw this coming mm -hmm. and started the research with a whole group of his men. Best to put a whole bunch of men on it and uh, made a big job of it. So, uh, and, but it took him about, although he could get small, small amounts of pyridine, you know, by different reactions, they, they took four years to get a catalytic method of producing uh, pyridine synthetically. And it was this catalytic development that uh, uh, what brought it about. You see, when we get pyridine synthetically, we get three byproducts. We get alpha-picoline, beta-picoline, and gamma-picoline. And uh, those are methyl derivatives of pyridine itself. It's closely related. So Dr. Sislak is to be credited with uh, the development of a whole new chemistry of pyridine. Pyridine, in its natural form, is only one of almost 700 different chemical compounds to be found in coal tar. Its contribution to the whole is less than 1%, yet in synthetic form, its contribution to the world is truly amazing. Even today, pyridine can be found as the active ingredient in the production of dandruff shampoo. When converted to acetylpyridinium chloride, it becomes a powerful antiseptic found in mouthwashes. And if used to produce aminopyridine, it becomes an ingredient in antihistamines. From alpha-picoline comes a product known as 2-vinylpyridine. It was during World War II that Riley chemists developed this material in hopes of finding an alternative to natural rubber. Although not a suitable replacement for natural rubber, 2-vinylpyridine today is widely used to bond nylon, polyester, rayon, and fiberglass cords to the tires on your car. Gamma picoline, used in the production of 4-vinylpyridine, remains an essential ingredient in the production of instant photographic film. In addition, from gamma picoline comes a chemical known as isonicotinic acid. At the time of its discovery, like most products of research, its uses were little known. Uh, uh, Frank Sislak would send out these, these new chemicals all through research laboratories all over. Well, the Hoffman or Roach picked up the, iso, iso, the isonicotinic acid was the, the product that he sent out. Well, they made the hydrazide of it and found that it was a, it was a cure for tuberculosis. In combination with a drug known as streptomycin, isoniazid, or INH, became the first successful treatment and cure for tuberculosis. It was this type of discovery that motivated P.C. Riley. And yet, sadly enough, he would never live to see the first commercial-sized production from the chemical division. After P.C.'s death in 1952, the company continued to grow with the guiding hands of Carlton Edwards, Tom Riley, George Riley, and P.C. Riley, Jr., Riley Tar and Chemical would build on a vision of innovation and growth set in motion nearly 60 years before. Yet this course, as in the past, would be one of change. By the early 50s, the chemical division experienced a rapid growth that was only equaled by the rapid decline of the wood treating industry. As railroads began to topple from the weight of insolvency, many of their suppliers did the same. And it was then that Republic Creosoting, the wood treating division that had supported the company for many years, could no longer be operated at a reasonable profit. By the late 50s, Riley Tar and Chemical consisted of a strong tar refining operation and a chemical division that was still in its infancy. Yeah, we had a couple of good products in those days, but uh, uh, it 
really was limited to uh, isoniazid and vinyl pyridine, and, and the pyridine business was just starting to be a glimmer, and uh, uh, the niacin business was still just, just we were just making uh, you know, the occasional odd lot at that time. So all these things were still very small. And we were, at that time, we were still very American oriented. We, uh, it, when I started, there really had, there wasn't much of a thought of the international market. Uh, Pete uh, Riley and Frank Sislak, I think, seized on that, uh, that if we were going to be successful, we should be an international business. It's the nature of the scientific business that you have to be an international business. And uh, Pete and Frank seized on that, uh, oh, I'd say in the late late 50s or in the early 60s and started to build a, a range of contacts around the world and that led to exports and getting to know customers and and uh, in terms of midwestern businessmen they were 15 or 20 years ahead of their time one of the contacts pete riley developed was imperial chemical industries of great britain and it was the building of this relationship that caused expansion that pc senior may have only dreamed of. By that time, we are, of course, we're in the synthetic pyridine business. So, uh, Frank Sislak and I used to talk with him, and we were shipping it to him in drums from here to coast and over to uh, Liverpool. And so I told Frank Sislak, I said, these people are gonna want this in, in bulk, so let's figure out how to do it. And figure it out they did, in true Riley fashion. Today, the Riley plant in Tertre, Belgium, is large enough to supply a growing number of customers in Europe, Eastern Europe, India, the Middle East, and China. Today, Riley Industries continues to grow by the development and introduction of new products to the marketplace. In addition, Riley Industries is growing by diversification. Two recent acquisitions to the Riley family include Wendover, in the late 80s, a company specializing in potash and magnesium chloride. Wendover provides Riley Industries with diversification into inorganic compounds, such as potash used in fertilizer and magnesium chloride used in ice and dust control. And Morflex, purchased in 1990, is a specialty chemical producer of plasticizers used in medical equipment, such as blood bags and tubing, and food storage products such as saran wrap and DEET used in insect repellent. In addition, Riley has recently formed a joint venture with EnviroSource of Stamford, Connecticut. Solar Aluminum Technology Services, or SALTS, will recycle salt cake, a byproduct of aluminum processing, into commercially valuable products. Each of these organizations brings to Riley Industries a new dimension, new products, and new possibilities. Yes, Riley continues to grow, but along with this growth comes a commitment to programmed innovation, strategic business unit activities, total quality, and responsible care. Today, Riley Industries has facilities throughout the U.S. and in Europe with plants in Cleveland, Provo, Utah, Lone Star, Texas, Granite City, Illinois, Greensboro, North Carolina, Wendover, Utah, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Tertre, Belgium. We have to take the position that we're going to be in business for many years to come, and we've got to be doing things right today if we're going to be in business for many years to come. And today, an investment in the environment and in quality and in community and, uh, uh, and in uh, safety and worker health and so forth is a, is a very important uh, investment. And it's, and, it, and it's probably as important today as building plants was to them uh, uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, that's just is a sign of how the world has changed and how how so many other things are important today uh, than just production itself. Responsible care is both a personal and a public commitment. 
safe and responsible handling of materials from the lab to the plant to distribution to waste reduction and disposal promises less risk to our employees and a cleaner environment for all of us. Responsible care is a commitment to quality. It's a commitment to the future. The history of Riley Industries is not a, a story about refineries and laboratories. It's a story about people. People who made a commitment to making a difference. The chemical industry as we know it today would hardly be recognized by my grandfather. Our computer analysis capabilities, our commitment to environmental issues, our team concept management style might all be a little hard for him to understand. But what he would understand is that the chemical industry has only scratched the surface of its potential. He would understand our commitment to quality that begins with the person filling out an order and continues throughout every aspect of our operation until the product is delivered and our customer is satisfied. He would also understand our de dedication to the development of new processes and new products. We have a vision for Riley Industries, a vision of growth, a vision that requires a renewed commitment to the disciplines of a growing firm, implementation of plans, budgets, goals, and higher standards of performance are critical to ensure our leadership position within the industry. Our efforts in planning, which we call program innovation, are designed to strengthen our competitive edge internationally. The company of the future must have a strong international presence if it is to survive and prosper at home. All businesses carry their own burdens, and the legacy of the chemical, chemical industry is no exception. With that in mind, our efforts in employee health and safety, communications and environmental care require the attention and the support of everyone associated with Riley Industries. For this reason, we're signatories of a program known as Responsible Care. Acceptance of responsible care principles is a condition of membership in the industry's two primary trade associations, which we belong to. At Riley, responsible care is a major part of the way we will continue to do business. Improving our way of doing things is essential to the future of the company. For this reason, we've established a formal quality impro improvement process. Quality does not simply mean the quality of the product we produce and ship. It means the quality of what we do. Almost every function can be done cleaner, easier, and more effective. Our commitment to ingenuity, to innovation, to progressive marketing, research and development, and management techniques is a commitment to the future, a commitment that was first made almost 100 years ago by P.C. Riley. At Riley Industries, we're continuing to seek new frontiers through the spirit of innovation.